Well, if you have your Bibles, in a few moments, I'm going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 6, 1 Timothy chapter 6, and I want to continue sharing on the subject of God's Word in regards to prosperity, God's Word in re regards to prosperity. And specifically, I want to talk about a balance as it relates to riches, a balance. Many times when even people begin to minister on prosperity, when they begin to share on God's will to prosper you, they don't cover the temptations and dangers that are associated with riches and how that we must guard our hearts. We must keep our hearts guarded in the area of finances and possessions and riches, wealth, if you will. And we must keep that heart, our hearts, yielded to the gardener of our heart or you can get pierced through with many sorrows in regards to finances and the pursuit, especially the unhealthy pursuit of finances. And again, I have seen, I feel super blessed, I've seen both ditches in regards to finances. I've seen the pain of poverty. I've seen what poverty can do to a family and grew up in deep poverty and in one way, I thank God so much for the way I was raised because I see people that are raised in, if you will, a measure of prosperity, and they just simply, especially young people today, don't have a sense of gratitude. They don't have a, a sense of thanks, thanksgiving for their food. I can remember we prayed over our food, and it wasn't religious. <laughs> we were thankful to have even liver that Mother cooked every week. Well, that was terrible. That's a bad memory. Hallelujah. Let's move on. And so I did learn a lot of things in regards to being thankful and appreciative and valuing things and discipline. On the other hand, I've seen again the pain that poverty creates in many homes, in geographical areas that are just poverty stricken and, and it, it's just devastating. On the other hand, I've seen people that have even come out of poverty into great wealth that the wealth damaged them. They weren't as committed to God. They weren't as committed to the church. They weren't as committed to serving and things that keep the heart, if you will, pliable and sensitive. And, and so we need to be aware of those things as we believe God to prosper us and He wills to prosper us. We also have to believe God to guard the heart and to avoid the temptations and dangers that the Bible speaks of in regards to material wealth or gain. And so those are some of the things I want to cover. I don't know how far I can get on this, but I have asked for another, another session if I, if I don't make it. So let's talk about the extremes with riches, some temptations and dangers that come with financial success individually or with our businesses. Because we've been praying for the business community for decades, and I believe I've heard God on this, and that our businesses have been and will continue to prosper, but even as a part of the business community, you have to guard your heart in that storehouse being blessed. So one of the extremes is poverty and holiness is synonymous. Poverty and holiness are synonymous. And that's literally taught. Many of you have been taught that. Many watching for sure have been taught that, that lie and that the poorer you are, the holier you are. That I must have been the most holy person on the planet because I had holes in my jeans when it wasn't popular. <laughs> I had holes in my shoes and there were real holes in my shoes. So I was holy by some people's standard. I've heard people talk about possessions and material gain in and of itself is evil, and that is not true. That's an extreme. A vow of poverty, a vow of poverty is not virtuous. It is not virtuous. Then the other extreme, the other ditch, though, is wealth and holiness are synonymous. That, man, if you really have faith and you're a godly person, you'll have wealth. That wealth and godliness are synonymous that wealth and great gain are holiness, or listen, wealth and great faith are associated 
In other words, if you have great faith, you will have great wealth, and that is not necessarily true. You can have great wealth and not have any faith, and you can have faith to move mountains and not have very much money. And so we have to, we have to avoid these ditches. Man, I don't want to live in poverty, and I don't want our church living in poverty, and I don't want our community being bound by poverty. Poverty. On the other hand, man, I know the temptations and dangers that come with wealth, and I don't want to see that happen either, with all of a sudden half our church really gets blessed and enters into great wealth, and now they can't make it to church on Sunday. Now they're not tithing. I've seen people when they were poor, faithful to tithing, that broke out of poverty, and now they don't tithe. That is not godly either. And so we need to look at all the Scripture has to say in regards to prosperity, not just one angle. So what are the four warnings associated with riches? Now, there's more, but I know I can cover these four. Uh, and I know I'll have time to cover these four at least. If we'll take care of these four, we'll be pretty safe. And again, we're a community. I'm committed to this thing for the long haul, and I'm going to be helping you, working with you, your kids, your grandkids, one of the one of the best blessings. I didn't realize how much that would mean to me. I've never heard anybody really say what was said to me Sunday, and I don't want to uncover anybody, but uh, this person thanked me so much for the message and said, you know, it just hit me after all these years, decades of sitting here, the dots got connected that you changed my mother and father's lives and God working in their lives and God prospered them. And I've inherited and walked into that generational prosperity. And it's all because of the faithfulness of you sharing the word of God. And I just want to tell you, thank you and hug you and how much I appreciate you teaching my parents how to believe God. Man, that's a blessing when you hear a generation praising you for straightening their parents out. Well, these, these four areas will not only help us immediately, it'll help us teach our children. It'll help us guard our children because a lot of the businesses that I see prospering are going to wind up being generational businesses. And so let me cover them real quick and then we'll go back and, and look, at, look at all of them. The first one is the love of money. The love of money being the root of all evil. We need to deal with that. And what does that mean? The second one is to not put our trust in uncertain riches. God is not against riches. He's against us putting our trust in uncertain riches. And that's a danger. It's a temptation. You know, when, again, I'm not trying to glorify poverty, but when you are broke, it seems to be easier to trust God than when you're prosperous. It's like, man, I remember when I had to put my trust, nothing but my trust in the living God, because if God doesn't come through, I'm going hungry or homeless or, I mean, I've, I've spent the night under a bridge. I know what poverty looks like. I know what it feels like. And I know what it's like to believe your way out of it too. Amen. And to have a guarded heart against an abuse of the message of prosperity. And a lot of people are preaching prosperity for generations. It's been preached, but we haven't warned a generation of the danger of putting your trust in uncertain riches. And we got to deal with that. The third thing that we need to look at is the deceitfulness of riches. With riches comes a deceit. Mark chapter 4, verse 19, Jesus said, it'll choke the word of God in your life. And I've watched that. Right here at our church, I've seen people hungry for God, seeking God, desperate for God. Then when blessings come and prosperity comes, there's this deceit that comes with the riches that many of them don't overcome. And it's almost like I've seen people come out of poverty into great wealth. And listen, there's a deceit that comes of putting their trust in those uncertain riches where they're almost motivated by fear now not to lose the wealth. And so they get consumed with maintaining the wealth, protecting the wealth, guarding the wealth. 
instead of guarding the heart of the deceitfulness that comes with riches. Number four, covetousness and how covetousness is a form of idolatry. And these are things that whether you're poor or rich, you can be guilty of. You can be guilty of. All right, let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 6 and look at the first one. 1 Timothy chapter 6. I wish I had time to read all of this. I'm giving you the reference. Please take time to read how that Paul is encouraging this young pastor to, to contend with wholesome words, even words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Man, it's like half of my ministry, it seems like I'm having to contend for the words that Jesus has spoken. People are believing everything but what God says. And so he's saying, make sure you speak these wholesome words, the words of Jesus and, and the doctrine which is according to godliness. All doctrine that is sound doctrine is rooted in God's holiness, in godliness, in, in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And so I've got to jump right in the middle of it. But he says in verse, verse 5, uh, talking about avoiding envy and strife and railings and evil surmisings. Verse 5, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds. I'm telling you, our culture is filled with men and women with perverse disputings. And it's because their minds are corrupt. The arguments before the Supreme Court that was being offered to terminate a life in the womb was so perverse today. It was absolutely perverse. It was like, what kind of corrupt mind glorifies taking the life of an innocent baby? And I've said this publicly my whole life. And I'm going to say it again. I used to be so perplexed. How could a generation condone slavery? How could the whole world? People today make you believe America is the only place slavery was, and slavery was in the whole world. Slavery has been a part of the existence of man since the beginning of man. It's evil. So how, how, did, how was it justified like it was justified? Can you imagine if we lived in the 1850s how we would be standing here trying to deal with how corrupt does your mind have to get to justify enslaving another human being? It doesn't make any sense to us now, but I assure you, 20 or 30 years as science continues to catch up with the Bible, there'll be a generation look back at us and they will say, how corrupt did their minds become to justify killing over 60 million babies? We'll look back on it. Your grandkids will look back on it and it will be an embarrassment. Like we look back on slavery now and we go, how could people be that messed up? I know how they could be that messed up. The devil. Evil. Corrupt minds. Perverse. Corrupt minds. Paul is warning this young pastor, stay away from these, these perverse disputings. Hold fast to the Word of God. Hold fast to godliness. Hold fast to purity and what is right. And while we don't want to condemn anybody for failing in anything, we can't condone evil. Amen. Men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth. Destitute of the truth. They have absolutely no concept of what is truth. Man, supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself. Anybody that's teaching that getting a bunch of stuff is godliness, we're supposed to avoid them. We're supposed to withdraw from them. And again, I'm not calling anybody out. I'm not calling names specifically, but you can go onto Christian TV and you can listen to people that you would think that godliness and material gain is a part of God's divine plan for man. And the Bible says we have to withdraw ourselves from that. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. I love that part. Some of you might have been born with a silver spoon in your mouth, but you're going out with a plastic spoon. 
<laughs> I know people that were born into wealth. But I guarantee you, when they die, they're going to die. Just like the rest of us, they're going to come out of their body and nothing's going with them. It's certain. Now look at this. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Now that isn't saying that's all we can have. But we are to be content with food and raiment. Now look at this. But they that will be rich or will to be rich, or crave to be rich, or desire to be rich, fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lust, foolish and hurtful lust, which draw men into destruction and perdition. Even if you don't understand all of that, doesn't that kind of concern you as a Christian? Am I the only one that reads that and goes, I need to be careful here. I don't want to get anywhere near destruction and misery and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which some, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Even if I can't take the time to explain in detail, what are the many sorrows we get pierced through with? I think, I think, if we're mature at all, I don't need to know what all the specific and many sorrows are. I need to make sure I don't care, get pierced through with them. That I need to be balanced. I need to believe God wills to prosper me and make me very rich. He wills for me to have things, but he absolutely refuses for things to have me. And if things ever have me versus me having things... I'm on the road to, to destruction, perdition, many sorrows. That, that, that's a little spooky. And yet, be honest. How many, and I'm not knocking TV preachers. I'm on TV. I'm trying to make a point. But how many TV preachers have you heard that have ever said, you better watch out though. Money will ruin you. It'll destroy you. It'll draw you away from God. It'll pierce you through with many sorrows. It'll produce destruction in your life. You may wind up in perdition. <laughs> you never hear it. Why? How do you end that broadcast with gimme, gimme, gimme? My name is Jimmy. My middle name is Moore. <laughs> and I'm not being critical. I'm trying to make a point. And I'm not speaking against anybody else. I'm trying to teach us to not be that way. Because we have prospered. Some of you are concerned if we've prospered and you're just having an ignorant flash. You've got no idea where we've come from. You've got no where, idea where this community has come from. You've got no idea where our church came from. You've never heard the stories of Sue and I having to eat for three straight months out of our own food bank. Because we don't like to talk about those things. I can't believe I just said it just now. But it bothers me, some of the new people, some of the young people, not understanding we didn't get here by accident and we didn't get here by a false teaching on prosperity. We didn't get here by gimmicks and schemes. I detest those things. Matter of fact, I'm overbalanced. I'm doing better. I'm trying to be repentive and get back to the middle a little bit, but I'm one of these guys that in this case, we can err over here, and I just told you of the, of the damage of it, or we can err over here with caution and protecting the heart and making sure as God prospers us, we keep a good balance. And so I tend to lean on this side for many reasons, and some of them are personal that I don't like it when people lie. I don't like it when politicians lie. I don't like it when preachers lie. I'm not talking about misspeaking. I'm not talking about making a mistake. I'm talking about getting up and you know that's not true and you deceive people to get their money. There are things said to, to the body of Christ that you can't say it out of its context and it be true. And yet the abuses I've seen have put an overcaution in me. But I guarantee you, I've already been out of my body once. <laughs> I hate to keep referring to it. 
but I didn't pass go and collect $200. I went straight face to face with Jesus. And I'm going to give a personal account and I'm going to give an account for our church. And I don't want to hang my head. I'd rather the Lord say, you didn't trust me enough. You should have asked more. You should have pushed more. Versus, you abused my people. You misused them. You created destruction for people. You created perdition. You created misery for people by not warning them of the dangers that come with prosperity. And so I'm not trying to be defensive. I'm trying to speak the truth in love. Go back to verse 6. Notice he said, godliness with contentment is great gain. Great gain. What is this contentment he's talking about? Again, I've seen people abuse this. I've seen people teach people that just have food and clothes and that's it. God doesn't will anymore for you and you ought to be happy there and you ought to there is a place of contentment here. Verse 8 actually amplifies it. Look at verse, verse 8. Verse 8 says, And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Meaning, the word content, Paul in Philippians chapter 4, verse 11, he talks about whatever state I have found myself. I have learned to be content, whether I'm in jail. There's a contentment you can have in jail, but that doesn't mean God wants you to stay there. And I've been in the palace with the riches, and I was content. And that doesn't mean God wills for you to have to stay there. Content means satisfied. It means complete and whole in Christ. It means happy. Paul was imprisoned and in the book of Acts stood before the governor. I believe it was Felix. I hope I got that part right. I, have, I haven't checked that out recently, but I think it was Felix. It was Agrippa. Thank you. He stood before Agrippa and his opening statement in prison unjustly, I think myself happy. Agrippa asked him, how you doing, Paul? I think myself happy. That's what contentment means. Contentment means I'm happy whether I have the boat or I don't have the boat. And God wills for me to have the boat if I don't worship the boat. And God wills for me to have the boat if I don't move my church attendance to the lake. <laughs> That was kind of mean there. I, I pulled that one back. I, that kind of maybe hit home. Content simply means, man, I've, I've known deep poverty and was content, happy, loved God. Again, we're eating out of a food bank, but we, we're, we're complete, we're fulfilled, we're, we're satisfied. Not satisfied to stay there. He said, I've learned. He's not talking about an emotion. I've learned whatsoever state I'm found in. Therein to be content. Not meaning we can't have anything else and we can't be any place else. It means while we're wherever we are, we're still loved by God. We're still rich. We're still blessed. We're still complete. This word, this word content means undisturbed by circumstances. Hallelujah. Undisturbed by circumstances. That's a content person. Verse 9 says, but they that, they that desire, but they that will to be rich fall into temptation and a snare. Well, we got to clear that up. The Amplified Bible says, they that crave to be rich fall into these temptations and a snare. The New Living Translation says, they that long to be rich. In other words, this condition you're in, you're unsatisfied. You're unfulfilled. You're unhappy. And your mindset is, if I just had more money. 
those people fall into temptation. See, what? Be careful, Dwayne. Praise God. Why, why do people compromise their principles when money starts getting involved? It's just like, why can't our politicians on a national level say no to borrowing and spending any more money than we have? How many times are we going to raise the debt limit before somebody's happy? Before somebody says, it's enough, we're satisfied. Can't you see it on that level? They're never satisfied. It's never enough. It's a deception. If we just had more money, we could fix our problems. No, printing more money is going to destroy us in the middle of our problems. But it's a deception. It's a snare. It's a temptation. And most of them don't know any better. That's why we've got to boot them out of office and we've got to put somebody in there that knows the Bible. And I don't mean kick them out. I can't qualify everything. I'm talking about an honest election (laughs) where we simply vote people in. I don't care what party that has principles. Well, if we as Christians don't have any, how can we expect these people up there to have any? Amen. I don't spend money I don't have. We won't allow the church to spend money we don't have. Then I expect the government to quit spending money we don't have. It's a principle. It's godly. It's defeating this deception and temptation that pierces people through and creates many sorrows. We're creating saints. We're spending trillions. You can't even... Get that in your head, one trillion dollars, what it looks like. And when you're four trillion over budget, when does somebody go, I think we've pierced ourselves through many sorrows and we're headed for perdition, total destruction. And my hair is not on fire. (laughs) And I'm not talking politics. I'm talking the love of money is the root of all evil. Listen at the Passion Translation of verse 9. Those who crave the wealth of this world slip into spiritual snares. Crave the wealth of this world. See, before we get to verse 10, look at verse 10. Let's do it now. The love of money is the root of all evil. Not money. The love of money is the root of all evil. It draws you away from faith. It draws you away from being a principle-driven person. You start compromising. We do it in our personal lives many times and in our business lives. Where just to get a little more money, we start compromising our principles, not realizing that's a temptation you have to overcome. We have to overcome. Again, it's the love of money that is the root of all evil. Listen, and a person that's broke can have the love of money. I've met people who don't have a dime that have the love of money. They crave to be rich, and it's ruining their lives. And I've met millionaires, saints, multi-millionaires, that it's never enough. When's enough enough? Never when you have the love of money in your heart. There is no enough. There are people... In Silicon, the Silicon Valley, the Silicon gods are making trillions, billions of dollars. When is it enough? It's never enough without God. Because you're trying to fill a void that only God can fill. You're deceived. You think money's going to fulfill you. Money's going to complete you. Money's going to give you esteem. Money's going to give you security. Money's going to give you a new identity. Money's going to give you favor. Money's going to open doors for you. The deceptions go on and on and on. And we're supposed to be wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. We need to be at least as smart as the devil. 
<laughs> and the devil understands what I'm saying perfectly. It's how he operates. And so we, we have to make sure we don't get in the ditch, though, and go, oh, we can't have anything, and, and, and poverty and holiness are synonymous. But we can't live in the ditch, too, that if we really had great faith, we'd all be millionaires. That is not true. The love of money. Go to Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28. If the love of money is the root of all evil, not money, and you'll hear this misquoted the rest of your life. You'll hear misinformed Christians constantly saying money is the root of all evil. And that is absolutely a lie. Money's not the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. And so if it's the root, everybody say root, if it's the root of all evil, we should be able to go back to the original conception of evil and see the root. Ezekiel 28, verse 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, Thus says the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Now let's stop right there because this is a natural story and it was real. This king of, of, of Tyrus was being manipulated by principalities and powers and in this specific case, this specific king was literally being controlled and manipulated by the devil himself. Now, a lot of times people talk about, well, the devil this and the devil that. They're just talking about evil in general or demonic influences in general when they say the devil did this. Because the devil isn't doing everything. The devil's not omnipresent. He's not omnipotent. He's not God. He's still pretending to be, but he's not. And so he can't be everywhere present at the same time. So most of the things we face are principalities, powers, or an underling demon, not the devil. Quite frankly, the devil doesn't have time. He's, his schedule's pretty booked with more important people than you and me. But this particular king, God does this often. He says, say it to the king of Tyrus, but he speaks to the spirit behind that king that is manipulating that king in evil because that king had not been in the Garden of Eden. That king was not full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. So he's speaking to the devil behind the king. Let's read on. Thou hast been, verse 13, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. Now let that sink in for a minute. I still don't have this figured out totally, but I've spent hours meditating in it. And I don't expect you to get it the first time you hear it, but you need to start thinking about what he just said. Every precious stone was your covering. Diamonds, gold, emeralds. Any, any precious stone was a part of his creation. This was one of the most beautiful. This is another issue. People talk about, well, God created the devil, and so he must will this evil, and it, we've lost our minds. God created Lucifer, a perfect, beautiful being, one of the most beautiful beings ever created. Every stone you can think of was his covering. And he names a few of them, Sardis, Topaz, the diamond, the barrel, onyx, the jasper, sapphire, emerald, the carbuncle, and gold. I don't even think he named all of them. I think he's just given us a few that this guy's covered in jewelry. There's no diamond on the planet like the diamonds that were in Lucifer when God created him. There's no gold, no understanding of gold. And the beauty of gold, like the gold that covered, was a part of Lucifer's covering. Thy workmanship, the workmanship of thy tabrets 
and thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. This Lucifer beautiful creature had musical instruments inside of him. Whatever an organ sounds like that is so inferior to any organ in heaven, he had an organ on the inside of him. He had trumpets on the inside of him. He had violins. You haven't heard a violin like the violin that was inside of him. The tabrets and thy pipes was prepared in thee, in thee, in the day that thou was created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. He oversaw all the worship in heaven. And we just, we can't imagine heaven. This place of no sin, this place of no death, this place of no sorrow, this place of no pain, this, this place of perfection. We have nothing to identify in this earth. The best of the best that we call perfect in this world is a stench in the nostrils of a holy, righteous God. And I'm not knocking the beauty of things we have in this life. I'm saying this guy led worship, and I'm telling you, he was the most gorgeous thing that has ever been created. And the music coming out of him is indescribable. I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. See, the king of Tyrus wasn't on the holy mountain of God. But Satan was. Lucifer was. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created. Did you see that? God didn't create an evil, ungodly, immoral, impure devil. He created Lucifer, this beautiful creature, till you were, you were perfect. Now, when God says you're perfect, <laughs> you're perfect. Just like my spirit has been declared by God is perfect. I'm telling you, it's perfect. The rest of me lagging behind a little bit, but <laughs> my spirit's perfect. This guy was perfect when he was created till iniquity was found in thee by the multitude of thy merchandise. I'm in the King James. I don't know how I got in there. I was doing the new King James, but thank God. <laughs> Here's the King James, brother. I got one person for me. By the multitude, multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profound out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of your beauty. Because of your beauty. Because of your stuff. Because how much you had. Because of all the merchandise, all the gold, all the emerald, all the onyx, all the musical instruments I put on the inside of you, all your stuff has corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast you down to the ground. I will lay you before kings that they may behold thee, that thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. They shall be a terror. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. Man, there's this fire now that's consuming Satan from within. That's why he's panicking as we come into the end days, as we become and come into the last of the last days, he knows his time is short, and he's being consumed from within. And it's, a, it's like an undertow. Those of you that have been to the ocean, 
there's this undertow when you get out there. It just starts against your will. It starts pulling you out. There's this undertow of this fire and violence in Satan that is pulling the masses into the pit of hell right now. That's why we've got to, we got to get our act together and save people from this fire. Notice that it was by the multitude of his merchandise. The love of money, the love of things is the root of all evil. It goes all the way back to Satan getting kicked out of heaven. So he knows what destroyed him. So how do you think he might try to destroy you now? He learned firsthand how to get kicked out of heaven. The love of money. And so we have to be cautious with this. We don't need to be afraid of it. We don't need to be overcautious where we refuse to allow God to prosper us. I hope I've balanced this out. On the other hand, we can't be cavalier as I believe the wealth of the wicked that is laid up for the righteous. When and how is it going to come into our hands? People talk about it all the time. You hear it preached every now and then that the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. Well, how is it going to get into our hands? God says he's going to command it into your storehouses. And your business is a storehouse. That's why we fight for your freedom and your liberty to follow your dreams. You can, you can attack capitalism all you want. You're not going to mess me up. You're not going to mess my mind up. I'm aware, especially of crony capitalism. I'm dealing with that behind the scenes with politicians now. There is crony capitalism and there's flaws to capitalism, but you show me another system that has brought more people out of poverty and blessed a nation to the most prosperous nation on the planet because of free markets and capitalism, I'll buy into that system. But I'm here to tell you there's not another system out there. And with all of its flaws, God wills for you to either start a business and follow your dreams and be a blessing to your community, or you work for a business that's following their dreams and are healthy for our community. The wealth of the wicked laid up for the righteous isn't going to fall out of the sky. It's going to come into the things we put our hands to. God says, I'll bless the work of your hands. That's your businesses. And that's you working for a business that wants people that love God working for it. I'm convinced, I am convinced that lost people want to hire Christians. They may be greedy to the bone and full of covetousness and just write out crooks, but they don't like crooks. Even lost people want people to show up on time, want people to not steal the stuff, want people... That's why when people knock Christianity, I'm thinking, you're just not making a bit of sense. It's Christianity that has brought all the values, whether you believe in God or not. We need values. We need absolutes. You need them as a lost person. You don't want anybody raping your wife, do you? You don't want anybody taking your children in and running them through human trafficking. You don't want anybody molesting your child. It's Christians, it's, it's God's word, it's, it's absolutes and virtues and morals and principles that keep a society worth living in. Even lost people want to come home and the front door not be wide open and all the furniture gone. Amen. What was my point? Because those were really good. What was I talking about? How did I get off on your house being burglarized? What was I talking about? The love of money, I remember that. All right, go back to 1 Timothy. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I just get excited. I try to stay calm. It's a good thing I'm not called to preach. I mean, I'd have a runaway, man. I get excited about this. I get excited about what side I'm on. On. Because I'm a blessing to save people, but I'm a blessing to lost people too. God loves saved and lost people. God makes the sun to rise on the just and the unjust. God, I'm trying to tell you, God wants to flood finances into our community supernaturally, into your hands. But you better have clean hands. 
You don't want it slipping through your hands. Because if God can make it slip through the hands of the wicked into the hands of the righteous, what makes you think he won't let it slip through your hands? And you know what I'm talking about, slipping through, meaning you're not handling it right. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. Verse 17, charge them that are rich in this world that they not be high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Did you see that? Who giveth us richly how many things? And why does he give us all these things? God wants to give us things, and he doesn't mind us enjoying our things. He just doesn't want us worshiping our things. He doesn't want our things replacing him. He doesn't want us putting trust. Look at this. That they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. So I love verse 17, charge them that are rich in this world. Now I love you and I know Prosperity is relative. And I know some of you are sitting there right now going, he's not talking to me. I'm the guy just came out from under the bridge. (laughs) But I assure you, compared to anywhere else in the world, the poorest among us are rich. Saints, I, I don't mean this to condemn you, but I believe I live, I believe you live, most of you, better than the kings of the Bible. Oh yeah, they had lots of gold piled up. Solomon had it all piled up, silver all piled up. They didn't have running water. They didn't have refrigerators. They didn't have artificial light. They didn't have heating and cooling. They didn't have the opportunity to drive up to a restaurant and order a meal. They had to have at least somebody go out and kill it. (laughs) Amen. They had to have armies guarding their stuff because the whole world operated for thousands of years in thievery, in thugs and thuggery. Most of the wealth for thousands of years had to be stolen. We're blessed, is my point. We have indoor plumbing. (laughs) And I'm not telling my grandma's story. I know some of you are tired of my stories. I get it. I'm trying to travel other places where they haven't heard my stories. (laughs) Because they're good stories. But he says, charge them. Don't suggest, don't lightly recommend. Look at it again. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded. Do not let the fact you have stuff create pride in your heart. When it is time to clean the church, there's nothing wrong with millionaires vacuuming and cleaning up. They're not too good. I'm not too good to help clean up. You know what I'm trying to say. Don't be high-minded. Don't be haughty. That job is below me. Well, you're too high. I'm serious. Any job that's below you, you're way too high. And I'm trying to knock you down in love. Because you either let me knock you down in love, or I guarantee you God's going to humble you. And you don't want God humbling you. You want to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he might exalt you in due time. No job is, none of us are above each other. See, how many people let material gain give them an identity that they think they're better than other people? I wish I could name names, but that's just not right, especially when you're going out like we're going out. People are struggling enough with anything you say. You got to be so careful, but man, I could start naming names of the, of the understanding of we're all one in Christ. 
that we're all equally loved by God. We all have equal standing with God, equal access to the throne of God, equal positions in the kingdom of God. Our clothes, our money, our cars, our boats, our planes, our homes do not make us better than anyone else or you not having some of those things less. And yet that's the temptation and the snare that comes with money. So charge them, now look at this, that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. See, the temptation that comes with money individually and the temptation that comes with our businesses is we start, it's a subtle thing. We have to watch out for it lovingly, not be condemned by it. We can't believe we're above it, immune to it. None of us are above temptation or immune to temptation. And the temptation that comes is you suddenly start trusting it. And that's what causes you to start to compromise your principles if you start losing some of it or whatever. The economy shifts or business and the ebb and flow of business changes with the economy. So you, you, you have to guard your heart not to trust in the uncertain in the uncertain riches. So I wrote it out as an antidote for you. How do, how do we keep our hearts? How do we guard our hearts? Can you put that up? Here's the antidote. Keep doing good. I wish I could name names again, but a friend of mine heard my message Sunday. That afternoon, was getting gas and saw a person on the side of the road just sitting there, and you could tell they were down in their luck. This person wasn't a con. Got to watch out for those and deal with that. They weren't militant. If you don't give them something, they're mad. and All those things that are real. But he, as he's pumping gas, just walks over and says, hey, are you okay? And he said, not really. And my friend said, are you hungry? And he says, you have no idea how hungry I am. And my my friend blessed him and prayed for him right there. It says he just broke out crying, thanking God for sending somebody. See, if you'll keep doing good, no matter how much money you have or don't have, it keeps the heart pure. And he, he encouraged me, actually. He said, you don't tell enough of your stories. And that's true. There are, there's hundreds of stories I've never told because I don't know how to tell them because they involve people, which some of you are sitting here. So I have to be careful. But he said, your story just motivated me. He says it motivates people. You need to tell those stories. So do good. Look at this. Be ready to give. Always be ready to give. You know how you guard your heart? As soon as, you, as, soon as I say, hey, we got Project Big. We're believing for big things. And this month, we're going to believe for, for 100,000 to come in. Oh, no, 100,000. There he goes. There he goes. He used to be so pure. He just used to be so pure. See, you're not ready to give. One of the reasons we should have vision going constantly, we should be doing something big all the time because it helps discipline the heart to be ready to give. You don't have to give, but be ready to give. Look at this. Be willing to share. Be willing to communicate. Be willing to communicate. I've had this vision in my mind, Zach, and I don't know, I don't know how to do it. I can't believe it just came to me. Am I out of time yet? Not yet. Man, I sure wish I was out of time. <laughs> I just thought instead of having garage sales, what if, we, what if we just had this big day that we brought all of our stuff and it's a free, some type of free sale, free, you know, we'd have to limit people from bringing a U-Haul and I don't know how to do it, but wouldn't it be cool? That, okay, we're going to sow to the whole community. And anybody poor will have clothes hanging up. We'll have some cars. We'll have bicycles. We'll have gifts that our, our kids aren't grateful for that they got last Christmas. So let's, <laughs> let's give it to a kid that's grateful. I don't know how you'd manage it. Like I said, I can't, but I keep having this picture of us blessing the whole city that we are going to talk about. I, here, I'm acting like I'm going to do it. I don't know how to do it. But what if we could bless the whole city, the poor, truly bless the poor. We feed them, 
we have clothes for them. But what if we, what if we just had this big, we just brought everything, all of our stuff that we, we, don't, we don't either need or appreciate right now. I'm trying to give stuff away all the time. Why don't we just bring it all and fill up the 10 acres and say, just come, call the community, come, poor, the lame, the, the blind, the, those that are in need, you're really in need. I, I just don't know how you manage it to keep people from taking half, one family taking, I don't know. I don't know if it's just my own mind. God, are you telling me just to give more? I don't know. But I think, I think this is how you guard the heart. I think this is how you avoid the temptation or overcome it. This is how you avoid the destruction and the damage and, the, and putting the trust in it. That I want to give this away. I don't know who to give it to. So we'll just give it to the church and the church just pass it out. You know, we just have a weekend. I don't even know how to advertise it, not offend people. You know what I'm saying? It's like, how do you say, hey, anybody poor? Anybody in need? Come, the church is just going to be full of stuff. Just come, don't take my cameras, but you can come take all our stuff. <laughs> That's what it would mean, though. That's what it would look like for a church for the city, not just a church in the city. What if, what if we wound up being so prosperous? So, so what if the other Christians aren't getting a hold of this? What if all of us got a, all of us got a hold of it and every month, we had, a, we had come to the church. We got anything you need here. You need a car? We got a car. We had a car donated. Come, just come get it. God, wouldn't that be cool? Anyway, it was just a thought. I just know personally it's how I keep my heart right. I'm ready to give. I'm quick to give. I'm willing to share. I'm willing to, to help. The third thing that we were supposed to go over that we're not going to have time now is the deceit of riches, but the deceit ties in to the love of money and to putting your trust in uncertain riches. And notice it says, do not put your trust in uncertain riches. Our riches on this side of heaven are uncertain. They are subject to thieves. They are subject to moth and rust and corruption. And so if you put your trust in it, I remember dad... <laughs> I remember my dad, I tell you, my dad was awesome. He was so funny. We were sitting out by a garden. He had a garden every year, a big garden. He planted in the sand in Orlando, Florida. So we had this big garden and he's sitting there. And, and I don't know how the subject came up, but the Great Depression came up. And dad, I'll never forget it. Dad said, man, we, we, we breezed right through the Great Depression. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, we didn't know there was one. Said, none of my family jumped out of windows. None of them took their lives. No, it, who, who was jumping out of buildings? The rich who put their trust in uncertain riches. So the only way you can avoid that deceit that Jesus said in Mark chapter 4, verse 19, it'll choke the word of God in your heart, is to be quick to give it. It doesn't mean you have to give it. I'm going to get to the rich young ruler. We're going to, we're going to break that down. I'm going to have to take another session, but we'll, we'll break the rich young ruler down. There's so much confusion with what happened to that rich young ruler that Jesus talked about. God's not telling us, and me personally, I have to give everything away. He's always telling me, though, I have to be willing to give anything away. Soon I went through a, a, a short, oh, I don't want to tell that. People will use that against me. But you have to be willing. Did I hear it all? <laughs> we, we just didn't know what, we weren't certain on what God's plan for me and how he wants to use me in a different way because he's been sowing me in one form for decades, but he's telling me I'm going to reap for him in another form. And I don't know what that is. And so we, 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 we thought I might be traveling just constantly. And so we went before the Lord and we were willing to give our house away. That God, if you want us to give away our house, that's the most valuable possession we have. And wives, women, that, that's guys, young, young men, pay attention. I'm trying to save you. Happy wife, happy life. <laughs> women need security. Women, women, the house is their castle. It's important to them. And I was just shocked that Sue was the one that was so willing. If God spoke to us, would we give our house away? 
We've worked our whole life and sown into that. That's where most of our money's gone is for our piece of property and retirement and all that. And the fact that my wife was so willing. See, God didn't ask us to give it away. He asked us, were we willing? Just like he asked Abraham to offer his son. Once he proved he was willing, he didn't have to. There's a lot of things God's asking you to do that you might not have to do or to give that you might not have to give, but are you willing? That's how you keep the heart right. And it, it really is. I heard somebody, I think it was a pastor, say so good. That is so good. The deceit is people putting their trust in uncertain riches. It's looking to the riches and the stuff for security. It doesn't mean you can't have it. It means you can't, you can't look to it for a sense of security. I mean, there's only been a couple of hundred people on the whole planet that have contracted this variance of COVID-19 and the whole world is collapsing again. A couple of hundred people and nobody's been hospitalized. I'm telling you, this is a dress rehearsal. What's going to happen when something really happens? There's going to be a handful, at least here, that know how to survive and that know how to thrive and that have practiced and disciplined their lives. I have put no trust in these uncertain riches. My trust is in the living God. He is my fortress. He is my high tower. He is my rock. He is the one that is my shield and my buckler, hallelujah, and my God will supply all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Again, it doesn't mean we can't have things. It means never let things have you. The fourth one, go to Colossians. Hallelujah. Did y'all give me extra time? Colossians. <laughs> Colossians chapter 3. I, I realize I have said this many times, and I don't know that I've ever showed it to you. And I actually, <laughs> what are you laughing at? That's not funny. <laughs> I was actually going over something that we, we were posting on YouTube, and it was just taken off with, with hits and, and views. And so they showed me the clip, and I said what I'm about to read to you, and that's when it hit me, I don't know that I've ever just showed it to you. I've said it, but look at Colossians 3, verse 1. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Amen. <laughs> oh, a little girl in Sunday school was was told that God is the one that created everything and God painted the sun and God painted the clouds and God painted the sky. And the little girl said, well, I didn't know God was left-handed. And the teacher went, what? Why do you think God was left-handed? Well, he's sitting on the right hand of God. Because I'm left-handed, I love that story. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's like I saw setting on the right hand of God. Okay, verse 2. <laughs> Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Does it take any interpretation? Set your affections. How many people's affections are wrapped up in their stuff? Versus wrapped up in things above. It doesn't mean you can't have things on the earth. It means don't let them own your affections. My happiness is rooted in God, not my stuff. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. I think they've put new King James up. They did and I'm still in King James. That's probably throwing some people. I apologize. Verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. 
Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth. Don't put yourself to death. Christ has already crucified the old you, but now the new you, united to Christ, you must put the deeds of your flesh, your members on the earth to death, your affections. Your affections can get away from you and draw you away from faith, draw you away from intimacy with God. Anything be can become an obsession and draw you away from God and your affections. Nothing wrong with playing golf, but every day, eight hours a day, you, you get the point. Maybe that wasn't a good one. Uh, let me move on. You, we don't want to go to hunting. <laughs> That could be too close to home, bless God. <laughs> All right, here's what you put to death, your members. Notice your members on the earth. Look at what they are. Fornication. Not your fingers. Fornication. Passion. Evil desires. Covetousness, which is what? See, when you covet, that's idolatry. Well, what's idolatry? It's the worship of another God. So see, the problem with things are, are not things. The problem with things is where's your affections? The problem with things is not things and having things. The problem with things is things having us. That's when covetousness kicks in, which is idolatry. Now, real quick, go to 1 Corinthians 1 Corinthians chapter 10, look at verse 14, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Pretty clear? There's a lot of good context around that. I, I know I can't, I can't touch it and get through, but the bottom line is, Whatever the context is, when you reread it, I took you there. He starts to now deal with idolatry. Flee from idolatry. I don't have 15 on the screen, but I speak as to wise men. Boy, that's my prayer. I pray I'm speaking to wise men and women today. Judge for yourselves what I say. Then he talks about communion and the cup of blessing and the body of Christ. Go down to verse, four, uh, verse 20 for the sake of time. Verse 20. Rather that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons. The things that the Gentiles are sacrificing. If you'll read all of it, it's talking about sacrificing meat to these idols. And those of us that are wise know it's a dumb rock. <laughs> Amen. I, I, one of the greatest personal revelations I ever got, just praying, seeking God, help me with this. I have never understood someone bowing down, you know, one of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not bow down to a graven image. I've never fully understood that, Period. Now I have revelation too of what's going on. I'm going to share it here in a second. I just shared part of it. Why in the world would anybody worship a bird? A dead bird. Listen, because it doesn't speak. You get to make the rules up. You get to decide what's right or wrong. You're going to do, you're not going to do. The dead bird doesn't speak. And so there's this lure to worship an idol because you literally become your own God. It doesn't speak. It doesn't lead. It doesn't communicate. And there are people that that is what they want. They don't want a God that's alive. They don't want a God that speaks. They don't want a God that has absolutes and tells you what they are. So that made sense to me finally. The Lord showed me that. Here's the other thing he showed me. Rather that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. So 
So see, when you worship an idol, there are demons behind the idol. The idol's dead. But there are demons behind the idol that begin to manipulate you now. Through self, pride, arrogance, haughtiness, lust. Covetousness, Colossians 3, 5, Paul said, covetousness. When you look at what other people have and you want what they have, that's covetousness. It's the 10th commandment. Thou shalt not covet. That is idolatry. Watch this. And behind every idol is a what? So covetousness has a demon behind it that now releases all kinds of lust in your life. This is why it's so deadly and dangerous. This is why we need to stand against it in our culture. This is why I've got to teach you you need to look at what other people have and thank God for what you have. And if God wants you to have whatever anybody else, is ha else has, God will get it to you. Right. You can't take it away from other people and you can't envy what other people have. It's covetousness, which is idolatry, which has a demon behind it. <laughs> now I guess I know why I never went over there. It's like some of you don't want to hear this. So you don't realize... This is what Jesus meant in my last session when he says, you can't have two masters. You can't serve two masters. That's right. He says, you'll love one and hate the other. You'll cling to one and despise the other. Think about that. When you covet and it becomes an idol, you literally begin to despise God. You start to hate God. And you, you can tell people who have big money, you can listen to them for five minutes and they hate God. Amen or oh me. They despise. They may cloak it in conservatism. And some of you bite that lie too when people are attacking conservatives. That you have no idea that not every conservative is a Christian, but I don't know a Christian that knows the Bible that isn't conservative. Was that too deep? You, you put down what, what liberals believe and then you put down what conservatives say they believe. I don't know if they're acting like it or whatever they're doing right or wrong, but this fits the Bible. Amen. See, that didn't fly. Some of you thought I just went political because I attacked your God. Because politics for some people is a God. It's a God. It's an idol. And behind every idol is a... And you see these people's minds are so corrupted. It's supernatural. You can't be as dumb as people are today and not have help. <laughs> I didn't mean that to be mean. I'm just saying I talk to people all the time and I'm going, oh, do you really believe this? Do you really believe it's okay to have pornography in our library? Do you really believe that? You want your kids looking at these images. You have to have demonic help to put pornography in a library. You can't do that on your own. Amen. Well, I hope you got something out of this. Amen. <laughs> Father, I just thank you for helping us guard our hearts. And Jesus, you are truly the gardener of our heart. Help us to be ready to give, quick to share, willing to share, willing to be a blessing, willing to give. Thank you for these grace rhythms of giving on the weekend and midweek now. When we bring offerings, when we bring tithes, we're, we're disciplining the heart. We're guarding the heart. We're laying the God mammon, which is an idol with demons behind it at the altar. We are saying to money, we're in control of you. You are a tool. You are not in control of us and we'll never be a tool for money. Thank you, God.
for ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart to receive. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hallelujah. Well, we had a good time in the Lord, in the Word, and now if you need prayer, please come down. Otherwise, you're dismissed, I guess. Is it okay to dismiss everybody? What a great service.